But yeah, this is uh, week 44 of this epic weight loss journey, and as you can see, I lost a couple pounds. All right, so the reason I did this this week is because I've been debating, uh, not necessarily everybody else, because a lot of people have been saying that you don't need to do fasting as a general rule with the carnivore diet, but as I've been finding out with my own journey, and this is why I really find this important to share, because everybody's journey is going to be a little bit different. Um, some people's journeys are going to be dramatically different in all kinds of different directions. But on the note of being told that, you know, you don't really need to do fasting, you just need to eat more meats and fats and focus on that. I mean, that's that's still up in the air for my own personal opinion to actually figure out if that's true or not, because... I haven't been able to nail down carnivore 100% until just recently. Uh, when I started priming, that, that made it a whole lot easier. So the debate of do you need to fast on carnivore or do you need to not fast is, is up in the air. But my main goal for now isn't just uh, getting in better health. It's also to lose weight at the same time. So I'm trying to do a couple of different things. I'm also trying to figure out a couple different medical issues I got going on. So we're just going to keep on working with what we got. So in today's video, what I was trying to hopefully help explain is the fact that, you know, hey, fasting does work with carnivore. You just have to approach it in specific ways. And that's why I started out with fasting in the first place. Because without the priming aspect, I don't think I would have had these results with the fast that I did. And I would have had a lot harder time trying to get through a fast especially a lengthy fast of a five-day water fast. So let's get on into this week's weigh-in and, you know, see what happened this morning when I got up. There's my cat, Dusty Bear. Uh, he's playing in the bathtub like he likes. My cat loves water. I don't know what's going on. Gray Bear's hanging out, too. I don't think we're going to have a, a cat walk us down the hallway today. They're all kind of riled up. They've been in hunting mode for the last week or two. Uh, let's see, it's about 5.30 in the morning here in Alaska. We're going to get on the scale and see what we got going on here. And check out that. Check out those numbers there. All right, 299.7. Okay, that's fantastic news. We're going to call uh, this week's weight 299.7. And that's a dramatic loss from last week. All right, so last week I gained about 1.4 pounds. And uh, my, weight, my total weight for last week was 315 pounds. Now, minus this week's weight loss of 299.7, that's a weekly weight loss of 15.3 pounds in one week of doing a five-day water fast. And I'm only on day four. So four, four days, four days in, I lost 15.3 pounds. Now, one thing I have found with the carnivore diet is that this type of weight loss can be sustainable if you come out of the fast in an appropriate way. We're going to talk a little bit more about that coming up here. But when I started the journey, I was 435 pounds. And this week's weight, I was 299.7. That's 135.3 total pounds lost in 44 weeks. So I'm finally back to that milestone that I was struggling with before where I got down below 300 pounds. So my plan is, is to keep going with what I'm doing, uh, finish this five day water fast. And when I come out of it, I have, a, I have a strategy in place to do a maintenance type week. And then next week, I wanna implement a different type of fast because I, I fasting just is, I'm so curious about different types of fasts, what they do and what they'll do to my personal body. Now there's several ways of doing these types of fasts. You don't have to just do a fast with not eating food. Now I have talked about and I have done previous videos on how to lose weight while eating food. And if you eat the right type of food, you can actually sustain the entire fast for an entire five days. And I only, and I only do five days. I don't do much longer than five days if I do a fast at all. Sometimes I only do, you know, two, three, four days, uh, 24 hour fasting. I'm looking at 36 hour fasting with a 12 hour eating window. Um, we're probably gonna do that coming up here after the maintenance week. Um, because anytime you do a fast and you get some dramatic results like this, it's important to figure out how to maintain that weight throughout the next week. And then we'll start in on another fasting process to lose some more weight. 
and we're going to see how that works out and hopefully that's going to work out but this other type of fasting that i've done and i have experience with doing this personally and i've had dramatic weight loss results anywhere from 10 to 14 pounds at times and that's uh using something like this right here so this guy right here at insulin resistance one i'm going to put a link down in the description section if you guys want to check him out possibly subscribe to his channel but he does a ton of uh, short videos here on youtube and he shows the uh reaction to what foods do what to his blood sugar and i find him incredibly fascinating um, he's pretty quick he's witty I, I, I like his content and we're just going to let this video play through uh, for a little bit to explain why i like uh, doing egg fast for instance so let's see what eggs do to my blood sugar eggs are considered to be a superfood by many people because they're rich in protein and they've got a lot of vitamins and minerals that your body needs so let's see what three hard-boiled eggs do to my blood sugar. Okay, so it's been a couple of hours after I've eaten the eggs. Let's have a look at the glucose monitor to see what happened. This is fantastic. A nice even blood sugar level all the way through with no spikes. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Eggs are indeed a superfood for me. They're packed with good nutrients that your body needs. Plus, they're easy to make, and for me, they're delicious. Stay tuned for more. Okay. So that's the reason why I like doing an egg fast, because egg fasts just seem to work really well. Um, they don't spike the blood sugar. Now, my first egg fast, I kind of botched it up a little bit, because I didn't really botch it up. I did well, but I was really, really under eating. Now, that could have, you know, could have been a problem, and this is why I try to share this stuff, is because you can eat pretty much as many eggs as you want, uh, when you're doing that egg fast. So I did redid a, another similar egg fast for another five days, but I was eating anywhere from uh, eight to 20 something eggs in a 24 hour period. And that was still keeping me in a calorie deficit. It also wasn't spiking my blood sugar. And in return, I was fasting. I was in a fasting state, uh, ketogenic state, and I was losing weight. I was burning ketones and I was burning belly fat uh, pretty quickly. It was it came off at a pretty rapid weight. Uh, pretty rapid rate um, the other benefit to doing an egg fast is you're you're also handling the latter you're you're dealing with water weight type issues and that's typically what comes off first when you start these fasts so in the first couple of you know two to three days for instance um, you're going to see some pretty big numbers drop off on the scale and if you're one of those that, that pays attention to the scale on a daily basis uh, throughout a fast you're going to physically see these numbers pop up on the scale and it's extremely motivating to see those numbers at least for me um, one because you know the whole the whole point of this is for me is to lose weight um, it's also to get the body in a state of ketosis it's also to potentially get into autophagy uh, you know the replacing some of the bad cells that might be randomly moving around the body potential cancer cells for instance and this is you know what they would prescribe like this type of diet for um you know several different types of situations a person might have medically so yeah definitely check it out egg fast is incredibly powerful and we're going to get on and we're going to talk about the next fast and that's the sardine fast so again we got another short video from this gentleman here at insulin resistance and he's going to be talking a little bit about sardines peppers and this can has nine grams of fat one gram of carbohydrates and 16 grams of protein so typically i'm not a huge sardine fan but these are loaded with omega-3 fatty acids which are super good for you and they're also high in protein some people actually consider these sardines to be a superfood. So let's give them a try to see what they do to my blood sugar. All right, it's been a couple of hours since I've had the sardines. Let's have a look at the glucose monitor to see what happened. And you can see there's absolutely no spike here at all, a nice even line. These are a great superfood. Eating sardines has been used as a remedy for a number of serious ailments. Okay, there you have it. Now, personally, I like to eat sardines as a, uh, it's almost like in replacement of a, uh, a multivitamin. So, and they have so much nutrition uh, in between the eggs and sardines. So now if you were to do a five day fast with sardines, for instance, uh, you would have much similar results to what I experienced here with this uh, five day water fast and vice versa. You can, you can do, you know, a five day egg fast as well and get similar results. I mean, I've done this process over and over again just to make sure I knew what the heck I was talking about and I could, you know, basically mimic the same fasting practice and get similar results. 
Um, my very first five day water fast lost me 30 pounds. I mean, that was, that was in the very beginning of my weight loss journey before I started doing anything else. I spent three months studying fasting and learning how to do different fasts and why they would work. And I, I, I gotta take this off. Okay, sorry about that guys. I had to go change my shirt. That other shirt felt like I was wearing a blanket. So this, this shirt here is a lot smaller. I would never have been able to fit in, in this shirt right here. I think I got a horrible camera angle, but you guys can see the difference here. You know, that other shirt was, I mean, my belly used to be way out to here. It was so hard for me to watch TV in bed uh, because I just couldn't see over my belly. It was it was so freaking large. And I think we left off with talking about sardine fast. Now, the sardine fast that I did before was just about as powerful as this uh, five-day water fast as well. But I was able to eat. And I also understand that, yeah, okay, people don't like sardines. Um, so being able to doctor them or actually hide them into your food, uh, I, like some things that I recommended in the past was uh, make your sardines up with some tuna fish, uh, make yourself like a tuna fish salad and eat them that way. You can also hide them in ground beef, but it, it's an idea. If you can grind your own meat at home, you know, just mix your sardines in with, with your ground beef. Uh, you can make hamburgers and stuff like that for the family and they'll never know and they'll they'll get the nutrition of the sardines because that's what goes into a lot of ground beef is, you know, not necessarily sardines, but like organ meats and stuff like that. They put a lot of heart, uh, they put liver and stuff like that ground up into, uh, the beef. It's not always just ground beef. It depends on where you get it from, or, you know, sometimes you might have to request it that way, but that's a great way to get organ meats and stuff like that is have it mixed in into butchers. If, if they provide that service at all, I also did a sleep study this week and I have the results that was a big deal and this is part of the carnivore journey that i've been going on because i've been trying to slowly work off um work off of the cpap and i was and the reason i wanted to try this was mainly because uh the lady i believe her name was barb that's her first name but anyways she was the one she was my technician for the night and I was kind of disappointed that this last visit where I went in, she wasn't there because I wanted to talk to her specifically, um, not necessarily for any on-camera ca type information, but I wanted to talk to her and tell her how things were going so she could actually see me again because she's the one that got me motivated when I was at my worst. I mean, I was struggling. I was suffering. I was one of those horribly annoying patients, I'm sure, because... When I first put the CPAP mask on my face, I was claustrophobic, and I don't know why, but I, I couldn't breathe well, so that was 90% of it. My lungs were extremely weak. I was having a lot of central apneas um, where my brain just wasn't connecting to my lungs and, and telling them, hey, you need to breathe, so I, it was a frustrating time for me. It must have been a frustrating time as a technician trying to deal with my situation, but I was really hoping to meet up with her and, and just show her, like, hey... You know, you told me that you came off a of CPAP because she lost a ton of weight. That's awesome. And I was like, wow, you know, over time, my brain was thinking about that. And I kept going back to that day where she was talking about that. I don't know why I got you set up like that. There we go. That was a little better. Kind of crooked there. But I just thought, you know, hey, wow, this lady did it. I wonder if I can do it. And I know that there might be other issues going on where I might not be able to come off 100%. But if I can, you know, minimize the amount of pressure that my CPAP's using, that means I'm that further ahead. And if the power should ever go out, I'm going to be okay if I'm sleeping without a CPAP. I'm not going to spontaneously combust in the middle of the night like I felt like, you know, I was before. And so my AHI, if you know anything about AHI, <clears throat> that's the apnea hypopnea index. Um... Previously, it was 96 point something. And this last sleep study here, I had an AHI of 7.3. That puts me down well down in the, uh, in the mild range, on the low side of the mild range. Now, when you're up, 15, when you're up to 15 apnea events, uh, that puts you in the moderate range. And above 30 is severe. And I was 96, so I was on the top side of that... Um, that one deal there well this is the paperwork here so so it starts down here and it just works its way up so i was up in here somewhere and a lot of other people that have been doing carnivore that i've been following they, they've had similar results with carnivore and how their uh, their apneas have dropped considerably 
If not, they've come completely off of CPAP. So that got me super motivated to keep going and want to become more strict with carnivore and see exactly how, you know, things would, you know, potentially work a little bit better. But yeah, I'm down to 7.3 now. And throughout the uh, sleep study, uh, they got some really in-depth results, even though they didn't have a CPAP on me. But the majority of my apneas were happening uh, when I was on my back. So if I wasn't on my back, my apneas were basically gone. I mean, they weren't, they weren't hardly there at all. So when I was on my back, they, they started elevating quite a bit. But as soon as I rolled over, and it's, and it's natural that when we start having apneas, that we tend to toss and turn in bed. That's 100% natural uh, for anybody that's even a healthy person. Because if you're, if you're stuck in a restrictive type situation where your neck's kinked up or you've got something going on, your pillow's pushing up too hard, it's kinking your neck here, that we, that we toss and turn throughout the night. And depending on how many weird situations we might get into, depends on how many times we toss and turn. So like I said, the majority of my apnea events were on my back. Um, and his advice was is to continue to use the CPAP for now. Uh, he did write me another prescription. I mean, but this isn't a, I am not in range to require a CPAP for DOT compliance. So now that monkey is off, completely off my back. I don't have to worry about that. And apparently uh, DOT would start requiring it if I was in the moderate range, which is 15 or more apnea events um, per night. So since I'm below that without a CPAP, I don't, I don't have to worry about anything like that anymore. I could sleep without it if I wanted to. But I don't mind sleeping with it because it's kind of like a security blanket, kind of like a baby blanket, you know, where it makes me feel a little bit safer while I sleep. Because I know that if I have, you know, reoccurring uh, strange apnea events, like where my brain decides to say, no, we're not going to let you breathe for now, uh, that that's going to help compensate a little bit for that. And I'm not going to struggle as much as I used to. So regardless... We're not going to try to gain the weight back. We're not going to try to recreate that situation because that's a horrible nightmare. Uh, sleep apnea is just absolutely horrible. And let's see what else he's got for anything decent on the doctor's notes here. Um, really not a whole lot. He didn't, he just wrote me a prescription and pretty much sent me on my way. Now the, the prescription setup is you know, basically what I requested, and that was pretty much what I was using the entire time was a, you know, I set my CPAP up myself at, at nine to, you know, a maximum of whatever, 20. So that, and it's on an auto setting. Now it is recommended that you not necessarily use an auto setting, and this all depends on the person too. I like the auto setting. But if you have severe apneas, the auto setting on most of these machines don't work 100% correctly for the majority of patients. So there's another off-scale victory. Let's get on into some more details. So right now I'm in my um, my health type account. Now a lot of people have these online accounts that show us, you know, our basic medical records and stuff like that. Now I'm not going to put the medical record up on screen, but I am going to, you know, just scroll through here and take a look at anything that might look a little abnormal to me. There was a couple things in here that I had questions about, uh, which was like my platelet count. Now I was a little bit concerned about my platelet count. And I did email my doctor and we talked about that. And he, he told me not to worry about that. He said, your, your platelet count has always been kind of on the low side. But as things are improving, I guess this platelet count has improved. So we're not going to, he said, don't even worry about it. He's like, you're doing so fantastically well. Just keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, we'll see you at the next visit in a year. And I typically get in there, you know, every, every 90 days or so anyways for one thing or another. And then I asked him, I said, well, you know, do we need to do another blood work result? Do you, are you curious? Because sometimes I'm curious and he might actually just do a test just to see where I'm at. But yeah, WBC, whatever that is, that's normal. HGB, that's normal. HCT is in normal range. Uh, platelet count is, is a little bit on the low side, but it's not scary on the low side. Uh, let's see, uh, reference range is 150 to 450 and I'm at like 147. So I'm just, just below the range there. So we're, we're not going to panic about that one. RBC is within normal range. MCV is normal. MCH is also normal. MCHC is normal as well. RDW, yep, that's great. MPV, that's normal. Yeah, I mean, this is just a fantastic, uh, you know, blood panel. And we were doing an extended type blood panel to try to figure out what was going on with, with, 
my foot neuropathy, make sure nothing else was causing it. So absolute neurotrophalus, that's in normal range. Absolute immature granules, slight, that's normal as well. Absolute uh, lymphocytes is normal. I mean, this is going to be monotonous because the majority of this stuff is normal, but I'm just trying to tell you, you know, for those the people that know what this stuff is, it's it's crazy because I've been doing, you know, carnivore and I did priming and then I did a five day water fast, but I was priming throughout the process of when I got this blood work done. So I was extremely satiated, full of meats and fats. And in theory, according to, you know, all the crazy wackadoodles out there, they want to say that this, this type of diet throws off all your blood work and nothing's right and you're just screwing everything up and that's the furthest thing from the truth that i'm finding out right here in my blood work for myself so everything just seems to be working correctly and i have a cat pawing at my leg and it's kind of hurting hello that's my dusty bear but yeah absolute monocytes normal absolute eosinophilus i don't know how to pronounce this stuff not a doctor normal absolute basophilus yeah normal neurophilus normal uh, immature granule site is normal lymphocytes is within normal range monocytes normal i mean we did a really really thorough blood panel here eonephilus i don't know how to pronounce this stuff guys uh it's all normal basophilus normal grf estimated is it within normal range sodium uh the sodium i was curious about that uh particularly but that is within normal range too and this is the part that drives me nuts when I have these arguments with these online doctors. You know, oh, you got to lower your sodium intake. That is the furthest thing from what I've been doing. Is My sodium intake is way up compared to what it used to be. Now, granted, I'm not eating uh, overly processed foods, which has a crazy amount of sodium in there, but it's not the right kind of salt. And that was my, my argument with this online doctor. I said, man, you need to you know promote healthy salts and how to use healthy salts and to get away from the overly processed foods. Or you can just keep pushing pills because you know your most of your patients are just going to return to the traditional you know, sad diet in the first place. But my sodium level was 140 mmol backslash L. Um, and that that range range from uh, ranges from 136 to 145. So yeah, I'm a, a little bit right in the middle there. It's not that's not bad. I mean, my sodium level has my salt intake has increased dramatically. I mean, I'm I'm putting salt in my drinks for my electrolytes and salt is totally required for life. If you stop taking salts, you become electrolyte deficient and you die over time. And that's one of the things that the preppers all talk about. It's like, "Hey, you need quality salts in order to survive if an apocalypse ever comes." So yeah, having a stash of salt is important. The people that have salt are going to live. The people that don't have salt and they, they can't figure out how to get salt or electrolytes, you know, when a, an apocalypse type situation happens, they're going to die. And I remember in the military, they used to send us out with specific type salt, you know, in our MREs and stuff like that. And we would always pack those uh, little salt packs away because sometimes we become electrolyte deficient. So we'd add some of that salt into our into our water into our canteen and we drink that we get our electrolytes that way it's just some of the stuff they taught us potassium levels i was concerned a little bit about potassium because i've been taking uh no salt uh which is a thing here in the u.s i'm gonna grab that right now <clears throat> just to show those people overseas because i do talk with people you know in austria and england and in wales and germany and stuff like that but this is a this is a product i use um to supplement potassium and you don't take a lot of it but i just put like you know five or six uh six dashes into my electrolyte drink with my salt and i put about equal amount of salt in there you know five or six shakes out of the out of the shaker and then i just stir that up and that makes my electrolyte and potassium so my potassium is covered you don't want to overdo this stuff because it, it goes a long way so if you ever decide to use this product you know use it really really gently it's not something you want to overdo but my potassium level was a 4.1 and i was barely taking this except for like once a day so i'd have one little bit of this um, so i'm getting a decent amount of potassium uh you know through my meals which is a good thing so i'm getting it in a healthier way i'm getting it in a bioavailable way and then uh, let's see chloride levels that was also within normal range uh co2 
was in normal range as well. That was 27 mm OL bun. I'm not sure what that is. That's normal creatine. Uh, let's see, 1.1. So apparently I'm getting plenty of creatine in this meat type diet. Glucose, glucose level uh, 83. So that's kind of in the middle there. That's a little bit on the high side, but that's still normal. That's a good number. Now, I mean, you could debate that number somehow, but I mean, I'm, when I did this, uh, when I did this panel, I was, I was a hundred percent meats and fats at the time. And I was for a period of time and I wanted to make sure I was before I went in to get this blood panel done, get these labs done. Calcium looks great. 9.2. And the, uh, reference range for calcium is 8.6 to, uh, 10.0. Protein total, 7.5 grams. That's right there. That's perfect. So I'm hitting my protein goals. Um, album, boom in. I don't know what that is. And that's normal. AST, that's normal as well. ALT, alkaline phosphates. That is also within the normal range. Uh, liver and total, whatever that is. That's, that's normal. Vitamin B12. I'm going to put this one up on the screen. Uh, I'm getting plenty a vitamin b12 because well guess what that's what we get in meats that's how that's how we get vitamin b12 and i actually kind of stopped taking the supplement because i have a b12 supplement and if i was experiencing b12 deficiency that would explain my hands uh, that would explain some things it would also explain a potential thyroid issue uh, which which my thyroid is, is just fine everything's functioning the way it should but being high uh, on B12 is okay. It's perfectly okay because your body just handles it. it. It flushes it out. It's not a big deal. There's really no way to overdo B12. So one of the recommendations, you know, after we talked about all this stuff was, uh, he's like, if you're taking a B12 supplement, you don't really need to right now. He's like, if you should start having issues later, you know, because you start getting away from the carnivore diet, then yeah, you might need to take a B12 supplement at some point. But since you're eating so much meats and fats right now, you don't really need to spend the extra money on uh, that extra that extra supplement. Okay, let's see. The last thing on that panel is methylconic acid serum. That's also within normal range. Thyroid studies. Perfect. Yeah, it's like a 0 0.944. So yeah, it's 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 working the way it should uh, we also did a urinalysis everything there looks looks normal no problems there immunology serology a and a screen it says negative I'm, i don't know what that is maybe that's uh checking for venereal diseases or something like that so i don't know i'd have to ask my doctor what the hell that means um but i'm guessing it's like an immune type response situation there so yeah, this is good stuff, guys. I mean, I've, I've, everything that I was on the fence about before I started carnivore is becoming a lot less worrisome up to this point because this stuff was incredibly stressful, especially in the beginning of doing carnivore. And I was always worried about, you know, vitamin deficiency or maybe vitamin C deficiency or possible scurvy because, you know, the one the people that talk about this stuff the most, I mean, they, they talk about carnivore type eating more than they talk about their own type of eating which is baffling to me because as a carnivore i'm not inclined to sit there and talk about somebody else's deficiencies as much i might mention some things here and there but i'm not going to hyperventilate on the topics like they do and this is where i had a lot of my problems when starting carnivore was because you know, we were taught to eat salads. We were taught to be vegans or vegetarians or, you know, that's just the way they were trying to program us from a very young age, like high school age or before that. They were trying to get us away from all animal products, make us feel bad about eating animals and, you know, put those images in front of our faces and tell us all the bad stuff about eating meats and red meats and pork and eating this or that. And that is not a good idea. And over the years, I've just found this to all be nonsense. It's like, man, you guys really suck. You know, you don't know what you're doing to your kids when you're just telling them the wrong information over and over and over again. And then they just blindly believe you and they go down a path of unhealth later, especially when they get older in life. Because now, once the damage is done, it's really hard to reverse it. 
And the nice thing about the carnivore diet is it's really helping me to reverse those problems. Now, all of this other stuff that I had going on would have been a lot harder for me to reverse if I was doing a vegan or vegetable type diet because it just wouldn't work. There's too many variables in a vegan type diet. Uh, there, there's too many variables in a vegetarian type diet uh, because you're so many things are added carbs, added sugar, and it would slow down or postpone any potential weight loss or health benefits that I'd be gaining from eating vegetables and stuff like that. Now, keep in mind, I am not against vegetables, by the way, but I do believe people need to be well educated on when to use them, when not to use them for specific reasons, etc. like that, not just eat vegetables because it's, it's so bad to kill animals and stuff like that. If we didn't process these animals, if we didn't harvest these animals or hunt these animals, we would be in a big situation here in this country because we'd have so many bison just mowing over people like hours and hours and hours of herds just standing in the middle of the road not moving anywhere because they're bison they don't have to but people don't think about that they just you know they're just blind to that whole idea of oh well we need to uh you know take care of them all and, and pet them and love them and take pictures of them but if you just let them go you're going to have too much of something and too much of something becomes in a nuisance and it also damages everything around it I mean, like in Nome, for instance, they got too many muskox in town and they're becoming a problem. They're a nuisance animal because they, you know, a state trooper, I believe, got killed recently because of a muskox. Well, if you just let the natives, the people that live there, take care of what natives do and that's take care of the animals that come, you know, too close to the village and just let them hunt that muskox, that muskox would have been gone. That state trooper would still be alive and... People wouldn't have to worry about their children walking out the door getting stomped by a freaking muskox. And by the way, they're they're fantastic little creatures. Pretty to look at though, but really crazy like. But yeah, it's pretty pretty simple to talk about what I ate this week because there wasn't a whole lot of food involved. It was a five day water fast. Um, I started that fast at, at 9:30 in the morning. That was my last meal, and my last meal was uh, I had some beef stew that I made from uh, some stew meat that we got at Costco. That was that was fun. I should have uh, made a video about how I made that stew, and I probably will on the next one. But I've never bought bulk meat like that before. And there was a lot of silver skin on there, on the uh, on the meat, that I couldn't get I couldn't get it off. I mean, it was just on there. I was like, well, fine. So I just cut it up, and I threw it in the crock pot. And it sat in the crock pot for uh, 12 to 13 hours, and it was just an absolute, you know, mouth-watering uh, type stew. And the only the only bad thing that was in that stew was uh, I believe the flavor packet. There was there was some stuff in the flavor packet, you know, that actually made the stew sauce. So I'm gonna have to come up with a, my own better way of making this stew, possibly with a beef broth. You know, uh, let's see, Chris cooks in Nashville. I'm always bouncing ideas off of that gentleman. You know, trying to make. You know, come up with my own ideas for recipes because he's done the experiments. If you don't know who that is, go check him out. Chris Cooks in Nashville. I'll put a I'll put him up on the screen. But he literally interacts with people, especially when it comes to cooking ideas, because he's done so many things um, on the ketovore, carnivore type plane and made so many different foods that, that it's hard for him to you know keep track of everything he's done. And sometimes he's he's he stalls out for ideas at times and he. You know, I mentioned to him, I said, you know, let's try making a cheese it you know, a healthy cheese it you know, out of this or that and this or that. And he's pondering the idea. He might actually make a video on his version of a carnivore cheese it Now, you can take cheese and fry it up in a pan and make it crispy. But I wanted to see if he could create something similar to a cheese it And I had a basic idea on how to do that. But he's kind of got everything there at his disposal so he might be able to master something that could come up kind of similar because Cheez-Its is something that I liked and but I didn't like the uh the crap that went into them so if we could make like a healthier Cheez-It type of snack I mean I think that would be a great carnivore you know plain type snack so let's see what else we got so what have I done differently this week well I got the uh one of the Life Pro vibration plates uh, that was recommended by the carnivore community and and some friends that I've been emailing back and forth with and uh, and I want to say thank you to all you guys but that vibration plate has been super helpful I've been using it every day for a minimum time of 15 minutes per day sometimes a half an hour per day 
Um, that's, that's two different sessions of 15 minute sessions throughout the day. So I might use it once in the morning and once in the afternoon. I find the most of the benefits is from using it just before you go out. Um, especially when you're having uh, neuropathy type issues or leg issues, or you're just trying to rebuild the basic structure of the uh, little tiny muscles that actually help you with your balance. So these, these vibrating machines, when you stand on them, now you can use them sitting down as well, but when you stand on them, it really works out those little tiny guide muscles to help you, you know, with your left and right balance. Um, because <clears throat> technically it's a balance board. I mean, it's like you're standing on, on a board that's like a skateboard that's just balancing back and forth. So it does require some balance. It can be a little dangerous depending on your stage of where you're at. But yeah, I highly recommend it. And if you use something like that, make sure you bend your knees. You don't want to stand straight legged on that. It will damage your knees over time. So yeah, take that into consideration. But yep, I've been using that. I have gained a lot of, uh, I want to get out of the house type mobility stuff. And the reason I was doing this water fast is to try to see how it would work after priming. Would priming work? Would I feel different through the water fast? Would everything just make a little bit more sense? And I, and I, I believe it did. I believe it really worked. Um, so I had a theory before going into this because I was told that priming was basically setting the stage for doing a prolonged fast or any type of fasting practice. So after this week is over, when I get the official five days in tomorrow, I'm going to start working on um, a maintenance type week. So next week there might not be any weight loss. There might be some weight loss. I don't know. We're going to have to see how that works. But holy cow. I mean, I'm, I'm puzzled. I'm intrigued by this idea because this stuff could really, really help people. This is why I make these videos is because I'm doing this stuff to myself because I've had a lot of practice. I have turned weight loss into a hobby and trying all this stuff. And I do have another fast that I want to experiment with to see how that works in comparison to this one, perhaps. So maybe next week I might continue to prime for next week. Um, and then set up for uh, the week after type fasting practice I want to do. And I need to look more into that fast to see what other people's results were so I can get a basic, uh, basic mindset around the fast of expectations, what to expect while going through it. Uh, because every fast is a little different. You know, we got 24 hour fasting, intermittent fasting, you know, we got the whole roller coaster type fasting. There, there's so many different types of fasts, even fasts that include food. So, and that just sounds ridiculous, but you know, a fast is basically the definition of a fast is going without. So like a water fast, you're going without food. Um, now an egg fast or even a sardine fast, you're able to eat, but you're going without all the other foods that normally have made you feel like crap. <clears throat> so anyways, guys, that was that's just been an amazing week for me this has been an amazing video um i am just i'm standing beside myself right now my cat bailed on me i thought for sure i was gonna have you know my one of my cats in the in the footage today but anyhow cats do cat stuff and we love our cats but i really want to say i appreciate all the help from the carnivore community and how this has all been evolving quickly i am uh, i am not alone that's the most important part. You are not alone. I'm not alone. These people are helpful. I mean, I have never been a part of a community that actually helps and reaches out in ways, you know, phone calls, emails, private messages, uh, new ways, figuring out new ways of doing things, new, new things to try. And I also want to thank uh, this one guy. His name is Andre. He comes into my comments all the time, especially when I was doing the 90-10. And he always, always... You know, he's like a thorn in my side, but he's a good thorn in my side, and I appreciate him. But he was he was always poking at me and saying stuff like, oh, you're all carb addicted and stuff. And he was being that annoying fly in the room, but he's that annoying fly you just don't want to swat because it's helpful. And he's, I don't think I'd even consider him a hater. He was just pointing out the blunt, honest truth. You know, that, hey, you're still sugar addicted. That's why you're getting into the fruit. Or, hey, you're still sugar addicted. That's why you're doing this. That's why you're doing that. Just try, you know. And he was. He was. <clears throat> he was ex <clears throat> <clears throat> and he was super extremely helpful for, you know, helping me get my mind on 
type carnivore. And he, he was basically a deciding factor before I started priming. I mean, he got on there, he said his things, you know, we talked back and forth. I always appreciate the people that poke at me um, because sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll take whatever they're saying and I'll twist it around and use it to my advantage. That's the best part about all this is because since I started carnivore, I'm actually doing it. I'm not just saying I'm doing this and then posting videos because that's, that's not what I'm about. Is I'm actually doing this and I'm just trying to show people the actual benefits by doing this and i say i'm mixing up fasting i'm mixing up carnivore and for me fasting while on carnivore simply works for other people they don't need to fast when they're on carnivore for me i tried it i tried omad um, i really wasn't getting a whole lot of success with omad i got some weight loss but it wasn't i'm not getting down in the ranges where i need to be which is under 300 pounds we're there now so a little happy dance celebration there and hopefully, yeah, we're going to move on and live our life the best we can. So if you could, if you found this video interesting, helpful, or useful, you know, please like, share, comment, subscribe. Hit that notification bell for our next upload. You know, I'm coming back every week, guys. This is what I do. And this is the only thing that I'm focusing on now is my personal health and sharing my experiences with everybody out there. Because I want everybody to understand that you can do these things and I have a lot of blood work behind me. I have a lot of uh, CPAP experience. I also have a lot of experience with fasting and losing weight now because this is what I've been doing. 44 weeks in, I can finally say I have some experience and I have a repertoire and I have a bunch of tricks in my bag. And those tricks, I like to share those too because those tricks should be your tricks and everybody should understand that weight loss doesn't have to be hard and we don't have to struggle as much. So anyways, until next time, guys. I really don't think any of these guys want me to go to work. I've got all three of them here guarding my bag. I just want to get out the door safely. Uh.